have to repeat some of that introduction. All right, we are now recording, and we're meeting with Bob Stackhouse and Carol Mickett, who've been involved in the arts a long time. Bob has been doing sculpture for decades. Carol has been his full-time partner in his sculpture and public commissions for at least the past 10 years. And the reason that I asked them to join us tonight is because I want to get an artist's perspective on how public art commissions work, and commissions in general. You know, because I think some of you need to be on somebody's radar. You need to think slightly differently about how you go about doing a commission. It's, it's a different set of guidelines. And I can address those, but I think I'll ask Bob and Carol to start. All of us who are watching Bob and Carol, you know, we can click on the window and we can make them be full size if we want. Um, Bob and Carol, Bob Stackhouse and Carol Mickett are in Florida. And I'm going to turn it over to you guys. The floor is yours. I'd like you to speak for, you know, anywhere up to half an hour. If people start interrupting with questions, which you guys are fine to do, I figure we've got until about 8 o'clock our time, 9 o'clock your time, before we move into another presentation. Take it away. Well, um, one thing we want to say is that we like Paul so much that we are missing the first innings of the Rays game against Texas Rangers, um, in which they are going to win um, that series and then go and play the Yankees and then go on to the World Series. So I thought you had to go to some fancy honor. ball tonight. You know, I think that you know which excuse you're going to go with. <laughs> we also just came back from the. Salvador Dali Museum, where we are members of a secret society, the Order of Salvador, and uh, we have medallions. Yeah, and there was a secret induction of people into the thing. Okay. Maybe thirty people inducted into it, and it was a black tie affair. So that's why we're dressed this way. <laughs> oh, I thought I thought you had a different dress code for these Maybe webinars. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, we we have dark clothes on. We live in Florida. We don't normally wear black anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, with respect to public art, um, we've just finished a large sculpture, uh, 28 feet long, 14 feet high, 14 feet wide, made out of architectural um, extruded bronze for the Hunter Museum in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which was funded by the Benwood Foundation. So that was a private commission, but there was a whole procedure being selected, and it was public art in the stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh. And we put up our website. So um, piece from it's the one on the top. So um, that was a public piece, and that is in the public realm. It's in a park, the Renaissance. Um, park in Chattanooga along the Tennessee River. Um, and then, so that's one sort of public art. Then now we're working on um, a commission for the Florida Art in, in Art and State Building Project. So that's a, like Is a... Any, Carol, are there any pictures of that on the website? No, because... We haven't done it. Oh, we're in the middle of doing it. Okay. I mean, we're doing five paintings for that project. Okay. So the um, sculpture that we did in Chattanooga, Paul, is in the top, the top rows is the Chattanooga sculpture. Right. There you go. Can All you make those. it bigger, Paul? No. But you guys can look at it yourself if you want to go to mickettstackhouse.com, M-I-C-K-E-T-T, -T, Stackhouse, S-T-A-C-K-H-O-U-S-E.com. Oh, yeah, I wrote it com. down already. <laughs> so this is a, you walk through it. We just were told um, yesterday that um, a number of people are getting married in it. And uh, so that's, a, and the, um, all of the trees and shrubs and everything have really grown up. It's, called Place in the Woods, so the idea is that it's surrounded by woods and you discover it and walk in it. Can you um, talk about how commissions happen? How did, how did you find that? And who found who? And I'd like to know how many different varieties of finding each other you can come up right. with. 
Well, the, the, there's the one, the, the, the first variety is where we get asked. Somebody calls us up. And Why would they do that? How would they know to call you? Yeah, well, they, they by reputation, word of mouth, whatever. Um, in this particular case, in 1983, the Hunter Museum bought a major painting of mine, and we've had association with the Hunter Museum. Um, I was the Lamar Dodd Chair at the University of Georgia for three years. While we were there, we were asked to go up and ju jury um, a uh, AVA show, uh, a nation nationwide uh, um, competition. And so we've had some relationship with the, uh, the Hunter Museum of Art. And there's a, you know, major collector, the Merrick, um, who, who knew and collected Bob's work and knew both of us. So they were instrumental. And I think that that's really important. I think every commission that we've had, we really have had some contact with them, either personal, that we know them, professionally, that is. And um, they've followed the work for a long time. Um, we've done other things with them. So there's some track record. And I think that that's a very important factor in this. So the track record the track record goes beyond a given director, right? I mean, they've changed personality, and you've maintained a relationship. Yeah. Well, let me let me just tell you a little story. Uh, we were judging this particular show, and Diane Merrick pulled pulled me aside and said, "You're going to give a lecture at, at uh, uh, University of Tennessee Chattanooga." And I said, "Good. How much is a, how much fee am I going to get?" She said, "Nothing." And, and uh, she said, but you're going to do it because later on it will pay off. So uh, um, we were negotiating, going through some of the contractual stuff, and we ran into her in the halls of the Hunter Museum. She took one look at me and she said, see, I told you. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it, it's those kind of things that happen. And, and this was seven years ago that, that this event happened, and it's taken this long for it to sort of uh, generate into, into what happened here. My recollection was you guys weren't anointed as the people who got to make the sculpture. It was a different kind of process than just picking you, wasn't it? Right. That was a, a smart process by the Hunter Museum, and it was funded by the Benwood Foundation. And what they, the museum did was it selected five artists that, and five, for some people, a piece of, a specific piece of work that they would like to have. So the museum selected five artists that they would be happy with. And then they had um, people vote on which, on the internet, on the internet and by ballot. And in our case, they could pick two pieces um, that, they wanted, and they picked ours in a piece by Terry Allen, and we both um, did pieces that were pretty site specific. Um, and I'll tell you, in all of the cases, in all of these commissions that we've got, you really have to work hard to get them. So we made a big effort. We contacted lots of people, and we said, "Vote for us! Vote for us!" And um, and we traveled there a few times too. Right. And. And we got by far more votes than anybody. Um, and it was, you know, we wanted that commission, and we worked hard to get it. Um, Would you say that the that, voting was totally pure? <laughs> <laughs> you could vote often. <laughs> no, actually, you, it, you could only vote once. So, but it was a wonderful procedure, because when we arrived, people knew who we were. And when we were building it, we actually lived there for six months building this and put the money back into the community rather than make it here and truck it down. Um, and But when we were working on it, people would come up and they'd say, oh, I voted for that. I'm so excited. So from the start, there was this buy-in to the, to the project, which um, – really helped everybody. Well, what makes this interesting, too, it's it's a museum purchase. It's a private foundation funding it, but it's situated in a public park. 
So, so we had all of these different entities that we had to deal with in, in working on this, this sculpture. So it, 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 uh, it has the protection of a museum uh, staff, uh, um, you know, taking care of the sculpture. Uh, the private foundation supplied the funding for it, and the, the city has supplied the place for it. So it all seems to work out well, and Chattanooga seems to have that worked out a little bit. They seem to be very interested in this kind of a, of, of a uh, and, and it's rather unique. Uh, I haven't run into it before. Carol hasn't run into it before. Let's go back to that in a minute. I want to, you know, we're going to touch on the specifics of how the, the commission worked, but I want to go, I think I'd rather go horizontally for a moment and consider other ways that you have been chosen for commissions. Are there situations where you've applied? Um, we've applied, we're not, we, it's hard to just apply um, blindly and get a commission. And we've not been really successful that way. Wouldn't you say that a lot of people do that though, especially if they don't have much of a track record or experience right. with commissions? And, and let us speak to that because um, Please do. We've known a young artist named Chris Fennell, who was a graduate student at Georgia when we were there, University of Georgia. And he has become, uh, gotten a lot of commissions. And the way he did it was he would go around the university and ask every department, every place that where there's an empty space if he could put up a sculpture. And he would do that. And then he'd go, any place he could find and ask if he could do it. And he did it for free. He, he also used, he also used free material. He'd find a tree that was knocked down by lightning or a storm and he'd ask if he could take it off, clear off the, the uh -huh. property. I mean he's done that with buildings. He's done things with old abandoned school buses and uh, he, he's, he's he's a master at, at I mean that's his real talent is getting free stuff. What's his name? Places to put but when His he, name is Chris Fennell, F-E-N-N-E-L. F -E -N -N -E -L. And he's, he has gotten a lot of different, he's applied for a lot of things and been selected. But what he did was, there it is, yeah, there it, his it, stuff. this way. Yeah. He, he's done a lot of it initially for free so that he can, what is that? <laughs> so that he can have a lot of images that he can send and he travels around to um, to lots of places and just asks. But now he's been getting. Is this his work, or am I looking up the wrong person? No, no. Uh, no, that's that's wrong. not him. You had him before. It's just sculpture. Chris Fennell, right there. It, it looks like it's a sculpture. The second picture looks like a sculpture. The yes, second it is. is. Yes, yeah, see. He there works, it go. works with wood, and, and this particular piece is one of his waves. Yeah, it's found wood. Um, okay. But so oh, what no. he did was he just went around as much as he could mm -hmm. and put his things in. And um, he got a reputation of um, this is it. The, yeah, um, it's baseball bats. And he he gets a lot of surplus material and just works with it. Yeah. Good idea. Um, so, I mean, he's somebody who didn't have any reputation at all, and then, and he made sure he had this website, and then he would send this stuff to people endlessly. Um, so a lot of people got to know that he was making things, and um, he did, you know, what wasn't big budgets, but now he's getting to do more of them. Um, so he's a really good example of someone who was a real unknown. So a bus, uh, bus, bus. Stop. Right. <laughs> um, he's also good at making things. So. Um, but his real talent is getting this stuff pretty much for free. Yeah. And he's very creative. Yeah. So I mean, one of the main things is um, is really to be. That's in St. Pete, actually. Yeah, this is here. This is yeah. from an old building. He took beams. You can see he took the beams out of an old building and uh, and made a piece. He, he just goes and volunteers yeah. to tear them down. I mean, he does a lot of demolition work. Yeah. But the main thing is he goes, he talks to people, 
And, and I can't stress that enough. I think it, it's that personal contact that um, really gets your foot in the door. And then you also, I mean, one of the things we've also done is we have people who help us. So when we did the commission in Indianapolis, Paul helped us. Um, you know, he talked to the um, Art Center in Indianapolis in order to coordinate that. When we did the piece in Chattanooga, we hired a consultant to help us with the contract and um, negotiate things because it's, you really need someone like that to maneuver. Um, the contract is always very difficult and takes a long time to um, accomplish. That's a good question. Let's say, how long does the commission take? From the time, I mean, can you break down yeah. the, the various stages? I mean, I think one of the longest stages is the, from the time you apply till the time you get the go-ahead. That's right. Yeah, we're currently working on a project that's, uh, we were informed that it was ours in, in uh, April. Actually, we were driving home from Chattanooga. We were just outside of Atlanta when we were informed by on the phone that we had we had gotten the, the commission at the University of South Florida here in St. Petersburg, wow. and um, we still haven't really started it because of of um, contract, contractual uh, negotiations. So it took from April till September to actually get a signed contract. A lot of it has to do with bureaucracy in states and universities. But um, that in Chattanooga was the same way. It took from May till September to get the contract signed. And the thing I want to address something you said a moment earlier, Carol, and that is I mean, that there's an absence of purity in the art world. You know, and I, I suppose that's true anywhere, but that you know, I mean, I did all the art for McCormick Place West, and right. I would suppose, I mean, I, I, I'm certain I had 500 people submit slides to be, mm -hmm. or images to be one of the 30 people that I used, but I think that probably half or more, I pretty much had in mind as soon as I saw the space, and people's art just started mm -hmm. jumping in front of me, so that the point is, you know, that you have to have your personality out there, you know, I mean, part of it is, taking responsibility for your art, but part of it's also taking responsibility for getting, you know, getting yourself liked. And if people like you, they're going to be more interested in liking your art. Carol, I don't know if you know why my gallery started working with your husband in the first place. And that was because well, Judith Simon. doesn't know. <laughs> I'm not supposed to tell this story. <laughs> Judith Simon always thought Bob Stackhouse was the most handsome artist in the world. Oh, and is? she insisted, huh? Oh, yeah. his, his director. My director. Judith Simon was my director. And she really, really wanted me to do something with Bob and represent Bob and work with Bob. And I went, no, his work is too literal. I really want it to be abstract. She, and, you know, she said, well, then I guess I'll just quit. <laughs> um, so I said, okay, I'd work with Are Bob. You and we talked. That up? No, he's not. Wow. No. And, we, and we, we talked to Bob. And, and we asked him to do a sculpture in our, a, a temporary sculpture right. in our sculpture garden. And he came out there and we got him students. And we got Bob, another way of making these things happen, for example, Bob was agreeable to swapping one watercolor to a guy, Rick, somebody who owned a lumber yard that I found. And for one watercolor, we got all the wood we needed for the sculpture, all womanized, treated wood and everything like that. And Bob worked on that for three or four days, and I thought it looked pretty good. And he looked at it, and he said, I have to leave. I don't like it. I'm coming back by myself later on to fix it on my own dime. So he came back, and I was I was totally blown away by not Judith was blown away by how handsome he was. I was blown away by his integrity. Um, you know, and that's what started us off on this really good relationship. You know, the yeah. reason I'm telling this story is because I want all of these people in this class to realize that if somebody likes you, you know, if you're drop dead gorgeous like Bob um, or whatever, you know, it, it so can parlay do, into man. your success, <laughs> a successful art for you. Do not be ashamed to use all the tools and talents and creativity mm -hmm. you have to take care of your art career so your art can take care of you. 
Now, and don't be I... afraid to ask for help because um, our experience is, especially with institutions, that a lot of them don't know how to do this public arts thing, and you have to carry them along. And if you have a, an expert like someone like Paul or this man we hired who was a public arts person, it really helps because it's difficult when you're an artist to be a, so much of an advocate for yourself because there's a fine line. So having someone else do it, they can say things and get away with it that um, you might not be able to. Especially when you're dealing in legal terminology with lawyers who really right. aren't all that sympathetic to, to your, your plight as an artist. And they tend not to understand how art works. So it's good to have a representative. We've done it enough. And, you know, I, I have a background. I have a PhD in philosophy. I was a philosophy professor. So I can write contracts. I can understand that that but it's it's really difficult and you need somebody to check like is this really like when Vince Ahern who um, was the head of public art in an, a place in Florida you know it was really good to have him is this reasonable to ask for the museum wants this should we really accept that um, and you need someone with some experience to let you know because you know, sometimes you demand all sorts of things, but you need to know what's appropriate for the situation and not. And that's where someone um, else is really helpful. And it takes the burden off of you to spend much, all that time anxiety thinking about how, it. How different do you feel making art for commissions is from making art in your studio? Huge. It's a big difference. Can you address that, Bob? Yeah, well, in the studio, you, you 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 make things basically sort of you know you, you could almost say and use another word on spec. You know, you you're, you're making it, you're investing your time in it, and the only, what you get out of it is is your time. You you really uh, are are working towards what you want. And basically, what I believe and Carol believes the studio is for not always a place for making finished art. It's a place for starting things and, and maybe getting in trouble. And uh, so what goes on in the studio is far more lively in a way than, than having to meet people's expectations. I think the, the world of public art can be kind of closed in and, and uh, they can, you know, somebody can say, we want you to, we want to commission you to do a piece. And then uh, you say, fine, and, and you, 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 you ask for, you know, visuals and, you know, plans of the, of the site and the history of the area. And then, you know, as you're doing that, they'll, they'll tell you, yeah, well, you did a piece back in 1978. We want you to do one just like that. You know, and of course, as a studio artist, you don't want to do that. Okay. But that, you know, that becomes maybe the, the, um, the balancing point, the tipping point of whether you get the commission or not. So that's a difficult situation. Yeah. How many different kinds of commissions? I mean, I guess you could be commissioned by a museum. You can be yeah. commissioned by a private collector. Mm -hmm. You can be commissioned by a private corporation. Mm -hmm. Right. You can be, uh, what else? A percent, you know, the typical thing you think of a public art are the percent programs that are city, county, state, um, programs. That's what a do you lot have, of Do you have your images are. in a data bank that these people go through to find you? How do they know? There are, there are data banks. Different states have different data banks. Doesn't it feel like almost every state has a data bank? Yeah, I think every state has one. I mean, one of the places we go to, I mean, our county sends out an, a list of all of the public art that's available that you can apply for. But I, maybe a lot of you know over this place called Cafe. Um, it's callforentry.org. So call for entry is cafe.org. And they list a public art that's 
it's available, and they tell you all the details. And you keep, and a lot of public art now, you have to apply through CAFE. And you can keep a whole library of your images on there, and they have to, they tell you exactly what the specifications have to be. And then when you apply, um, you, you do all of your application on CAFE, and you have your images, they tell you how many, and then you send it through there. Um, a lot of public art places are using CAFE as their way, their vehicle. Instead I didn't know of, about this. Instead of just having lots of people send in their things. Now, now when they get an application, every <laughs> application is exactly the same. So it's a much more objective um, type of, of applying for them. And they're very strict. Oh, have, very strict. You have to have so many words and you yeah. can't have more. <laughs> yeah, if you have one space extra, they send it back. So, I mean, this is a place that you definitely should look at and be a member of and have your photographs of your work on there and check it periodically to see what's um, available. Also, um, there's a, a thing called Americans for the Arts, and it's artsusa.org. Now, that's a place you have to pay to be a member and you pay $50, but they have, like, they have web seminars, they have Carol, listeners. what do you think the address is? It's artsusa.org. That's what I have, and that's not right. Artsusa.org. That's because it's arts plural, A-R-T-S. Oh, um, that's not it. Oh, you need ART. There you go. Okay. This is it. And um, I was told about it by the woman who was the head of the county arts program here. And they have, it's not only for artists, it's for arts administrators. And there's all sorts of chat rooms. And um, um, I've just recently become a member. And it's got tons of things on it. Um, so I think this is really worthwhile looking at and um, and checking out. And Paul, you may find it interesting because of what you do, but um, they do have these web ser seminars on it. And there's a bunch of them on public art. I'll oh, look it up more later. That's a good idea. How did we disappear? You did? Yeah. I'm sending everybody an email. I'm putting these links here, um, but we can still hear each oh, other. Oh, there we are. Okay. Um, oh, okay. So, those are, so you want to look at those things, but I want to go back and stress that a lot of it has to do with talking to people and um, having people as your advocate. And I'll tell you, it takes a long time to get people to put you forward. But it's worth all the things that you have to do. Um, I keep, keep disappearing. <laughs> to, um, to get that. OK. Um, Bob, talk about Steve Oliver. How did that work? How did that happen? Um, Steve Oliver um, is, is the owner of a place called the Steve and Nancy Oliver Ranch in uh, Northern California, and it's on hundreds of acres, and it's a, an incredible place. It's not quite 100% public yet, but Steve Oliver somehow or another knew of me through through magazines or reputation or whatever and searched me down in a, in a gallery that was shown with in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles. And he wasn't quite satisfied with the link up he got from them and he traced me back to my studio in Soho, New York City. And uh, he, um, 
explained to me what he was doing and, and wanted to commission me to do a piece. But at the time, his ranch was partially a sheep ranch. He bred uh, black-faced twin sheep. And he, he bought two of them for his daughters as pets. And, of course, he never could, could stand the thought of slaughtering them. So he got into raising them as, as breeding sheep only. And so there were hundreds of these black-faced twin sheep all over the place. And his, his request to me was, this is in, in Geyserville, California, right off the Russian River, uh, about 100 miles north of San Francisco, in, in the, the uh, Sonoma County Wine District, uh, Russian River, uh, Alexander Valley, very famous wineries around there. And... Uh, he, you could, from Highway 101, you could see a lot of his property, and he didn't want to have highway drive-by art, but he requested from me to have a piece that you could see from the highway. Uh, he didn't have a good relationship with the townspeople of Healdsburg, which were very um, conservative at the time, and the thought of this crazy guy building these big, massive, expensive sculptures on his property was maybe too much back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. So he, uh, he requested that it be seen from the highway, but also that it could be something that, that could be used when he could bring up people from the uh, San Francisco Art Institute, uh, or Art, uh, Contemporary Art, what, uh, I, I can't remember which one it is, but he was on the board of directors, so he had these big shindigs in, uh, and he wanted it to be a, a, a platform, a deck for people to be able to stand on it and have drink Shibli and look at the sunset over the Russian River. And thirdly, he wanted me to design it so his sheep could use it. And so that was very perplexing to me. What do I know about sheep? But while I was out there during in the, the uh, earthquake of uh, um, 1989 during the World Series, um, I was building it there. But, but while I was out there previous, I'd flown out there a number of times and uh, noticed that the sheep do two things pretty regularly. One is they um, rubbed against things. And two, they sought shade. So what I proceeded to do was to build this object that you could walk on yeah. that uh, uh, you could then, uh, uh, the sheep could be underneath and rub against it while you stand there and look at the, the Russian River and people driving by could look up and see everybody doing that. So uh, you had it back there, Paul. You had the, uh, the, the Russian River. Uh, well, you're on images, the I think. Ranch. Yeah. yeah, but I couldn't find your piece there. Go to, go to images. Have to scroll it's, it's in there. He uses it a lot because he's got my name right up front. Is well, that the what? The third picture? That's not it. That's not it? No. No, no that's, that's, that's Sarah uh, there. Hamilton there. Um, <laughs> no, that's not it. That's not it. No, that's okay. Keep talking, Bob. So, so that was, uh, you know, a, a, an odd request from him, but he, he's an incredible person as, as far as his vision for this uh, sculpture park. The sculpture park in, in that, uh, you know, he, he built a guest house that's, that's this incredible piece of architecture. It's right here on the upper right-hand corner, upper left-hand corner. Yeah, the thing in the blue. The blue thing. Yeah, right there. That, that building is the guest house. And they or the architect oriented that house to where you stand in it and look down this wall. The the wall pointed directly at my sculpture. It's an incredible structure. And uh, it's it's sort of built into the ground. And uh, so uh, it's and he made when, it so the closets are really teeny because he didn't want people to stay more than three days. Here's another one down here. Uh, Robert Stackhouse and Ursula. That's what he's been uh, um, clicking. Uh, is it? He clicked it before. Yeah. Um, he's just going to scroll through. Yeah. Because yeah, um, it, it, it puts me right in now, front of the, the thing about something about Steve Oliver, which is um, 
you know, he's a real exception um, to a lot of people. Like, for example, the sculpture of Bob's up there, you know, it's made out of painted wood. And Steve Oliver, to repair it, got exactly the wood that Bob made and the paint and even made sure that he put the mistakes in that Bob made and replaced every piece of wood. Um, wow. So, I mean, he's this really exceptional guy that, you know, in one's life you, you get to meet, much like Paul Klein. Oh, yeah, right. Um, Steve Oliver is a special guy. Hey, Bob, what was your first commit? When was your first commission? Public art. First commission. Um, um, Didn't you have some museum shows early on, like in Washington, where they commissioned you to do a temporary object that was part of the show? Oh, uh, Sleeping King Ascendant. Yeah, I got two hundred dollars to do that. <laughs> um, my my good friend Roy Slade, who was the director of the museum at the time, uh, wanted to give me a drawing show, some charcoals I did, and I said if I do that. Uh, he's going to put me down in the basement next to the bathrooms where they show a lot of drawing shows. So I told him I wanted to do it uh, back in the late 70s. Oh, here it is there right it here is. in the second one down. So I did this 40-foot uh, long by 20-foot tall uh, truncated pyramid going through the uh, uh, skylight. <laughs> uh, but what made it a drawing is it's only four inches thick. It's really a, a freestanding uh, or a, a, a standing uh, two-dimensional pyramid rather than a, a, a three-dimensional pyramid. Actually, when you come up the stairs at the Corcoran Gallery of Art, you don't even know it's there. It's, it's almost invisible. This is a good sign. When was your yeah, first? <laughs> when was your Wait, first public? Know this was here. I'm glad you could to join us, Carol. Uh, yeah. Ah. Bob, when was your first permanent commission? The first permanent piece I did. Australia? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, it was uh, the um, on the beach again in Australia. It's a it's a big bronze piece at the National Gallery of Australia. You uh, how did that happen? I want to you know because I'm assuming that most of the people in this program workshop course I never know what to call it have not had public commissions previously. And I want to give them a. I want to establish a couple things. One is that is it within their realm? Is this something that they would enjoy doing? And what can we tell them to have some sense? Because you know most of them are making work that would fit on a normal wall. Um, yeah. Oh, it fit on a second, wall. So I want I want them to have a sense that this is a direction they do or don't want to go. I mean, there's a bunch of accomplished artists in here, but I don't think they've dealt with public commissions as a mindset. And the second thing I want you to share is how the first experience went and how come you are willing to do it again? Uh -huh. Well, if, if you consider Sleeping King Ascending uh, uh, my first experience, um, that's, as I said, 20 feet tall, but I built it in a studio that was only seven foot tall. So it had to be built in modular units and then it had to be disassembled uh, it never, I never saw it until it was finished in this, in this state. So it, I just had that faith in what I could draw on graph paper. I mean, I was trained as a painter, and this was really a, a major uh, attempt of me. And I'm trying to tie into the history of the Corcoran Gallery of Art at the time. Um, a year and a half earlier than that, they did a show called Scale as Content, which was a major show which included a big, X made by Ronald Bladen, a big tetrahedon sculpture that wrapped, it was called Smoke, that wrapped around the columns, and Barnett Newman's broken obelisk outside. And so there were three pieces in the entire Corcoran Gallery of Art. Mm -hmm. And I really thought this space can handle something really monumental. These are 20 foot ceilings. You know, so so I, it, it, was a, it, it was a piece of architecture that said, you can make art here. You can do something here. It's it, it gave me a place to start. Now, I'm a painter, and I was taught to stand in front of a Jackson Pollock, but to move up to it to where it went past my peripheral vision mm -hmm. so that it became a place. Now, I always remembered that and always was kind of felt that the limitations of just doing that on a canvas, on a wall, was great. 
And then it, it was really surprising to me with Sleeping King Ascending that it had this two-dimensionality to it, but it was a three-dimensional object. It's like standing a card, you know, a playing card on a table and looking at it from one end. It becomes almost invisible. So from one end of the gallery, it's this big, massive structure. But then from coming up the main stairs, you don't even see it because the columns are bigger than, than the, the piece appears. It disappeared. And I really was infatuated with that, how I could build something so large that disappeared in its environment. Now, that has to do with learning a lesson about standing in front of a pollock and, and playing with its sense of space and place. And I forgot what the second part was. But, did, so, but you really enjoyed, so I, I'm getting the feeling that you enjoy commissions at least as much, maybe more than studio art, plop art. Well, you know. Well, talk about Chattanooga and why that was so cool, well, about living there. Well, yeah, um, uh, with, with Chattanooga, we immediately went up there because we knew Chattanooga and loved Chattanooga. It's, it's just a beautiful city, and it's, it's uh uh, it's a year-round kind of outdoor city. I mean, people are always around doing things. And, uh, um, and we, we went up there and, you know, really wanted to work with the river. We wanted, we've been working with water as a, as a structural image and uh, how to make water as, as an object uh -huh. and, and the experience of that. And so we were very attracted to to that, but we were also, the site we were given was in the woods, and or so we thought. Because we went up there at first and we saw the woods and we thought, wow, these are pretty good woods. But then when we got there finally, after we got the commission even, we realized the woods are really more like scrubs. I mean, there's, there, there were bushes and vines up climbing up dead trees, and there were really junk trees and, and but anyway, we were, we were really attached to that, and then we got attached to the history of Chattanooga in uh, the, the, the importance of the site. Where we built our sculpture was where a military bridge mm -hmm. was the first bridge to cross the, the, the uh, Tennessee River. It was built by Union troops. They happened to be colored Union troops, as the sign says, and they, they had a camp right where our sculpture was. We moved our sculpture just down a little bit because we figured that was very important ground. It's also one of the starting points for the Trail of Tears when they decided that the Cherokee Nation was not part of America and they moved them out to Oklahoma. And they walked them all the way out to Oklahoma. And this is one of the gathering places. Uh -huh. Also directly across from the river is a place called Ross's Landing where a chief of the Cherokees sort of had a trading post and it's sort of thought of as the very start of the community of Chattanooga. So we were very much in, involved in that. We went up there to work on it and we, we rented a house to live in and we hired people from the, the area. So uh, we got this very large commission and we probably left two thirds of the commission in Chattanooga, instead of building it somewhere else, instead of building it in Walla Walla, Washington, or, or in Sarasota, Florida, or other places that could have built it, we worked with local people because this was a commission for that place. So we, we sort of dedicated the sculpture as a, not only as a, a sculpture of Chattanooga, but a, a sculpture for Chattanooga. And uh, okay. and built by Chattanoogans. Right. So you would say that you're doing commissions has greatly augmented your professional practice. Well, here, here's a sidebar. I mean, I know when I lived in New York City, uh, you know, artists, especially in the 70s and 80s, were pretty individualistic and didn't, you know, sort of were always sniping at each other a lot. There was this movement and that movement. There were the new realists coming in on top of the the formalists. And, you know, there's all this little kind of sniping going on. But every once in a while, somebody would say, we're going to do a show about something, and there would be a theme to it. And everybody jumped into it, you know, because it was like a holiday for artists. I mean, in other words, you could sort of break out of your niche. You could, you could take chances. And I think that's one thing that, that really has uh, uh, 
you know, led led me into the attraction of collaborative work mm -hmm. is is that you 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 know I can't make the decisions myself, you know, and I have to take into account Carol's point of view with that. Now this is nothing new. I you know, Carol and I have built have done over seventy prints, and we've worked mostly with with. Uh, um, uh, master printers, and that's a collaboration of a mm -hmm. sort. You know, you, you can't just go and tell a master printer, I want you to do this, and if, if they're not going to do it, they're, they're probably not going to do it. So, uh, at least the master printers I knew, you know, like Jack Lemon and other kind of people like that, you know, they, they have their own ideas as well. You have to be able to dialogue with them and to try to find out what they can do, what they're willing for you, to do. But for you, that generates a lot of growth in your career, the necessity of aesthetic responses to external stimuli or other people. Well, it, it also does it. Here's an example. Um, this and on, Later on in October, we're going to be in New York at the 50th anniversary for the International Sculpture Center. and. You know, we're going to sit at a table, and all of the people we're sitting with are from Chattanooga. Um, so, um, you know, the former board uh, president of the Hunter and different um, sort of major people in Chattanooga, and we're doing that. We called them and said, one of them, we want to. So we have this ongoing relationship. With them. <laughs> which will also um, continue on, and it's all because we had that commission. Um, without that commission, um, that we wouldn't have those relationships. So um, it it's really does help your career a lot. It also, um, we also help them. Um, they have a sculpture um, organization that actually partners in Chicago with a group in Chicago, and they show together at these different um, venues around the country. Um, so we always hook them up. You know, we know them, and if people ask us about um, sculpture in public places, we'll say, "Oh, well, call Verena Baxter because she's the head of this organization." The Southeast Art Alliance. Right, Southeast Art Alliance. And they, they hook up with with an art alliance out of Chicago. Right. And uh, we we were able to jury a show of theirs. Uh, right. In last uh, last September. Yeah, and they're connected with the International Sculpture Center. They're the group that published Sculpture Magazine. So there's this whole network, and so since they know us. We help them. Um, so you, by meeting people through these public art um, venues, uh, you widen your network of people who you can help and they can help you. And it's just much more interesting. I don't think this is the, the, the site. I think it's a sculpture. It's a sculpture. It's a Chicago thing. area sculpture, something in there, I think is what it's called. Mm -hmm. um, All right. They, um, let me look for that. And why don't we open this up to anybody else who wants to ask questions and before we move on. Um, I'm going to unmute everybody here, even Hello. Bob, and unmute all. Everybody's unmuted. Somebody jump in. I have a question. It's Aaron Grammer. Aaron? Okay, Aaron. Uh, my name's Aaron. Can Aaron. you hear me okay? Yeah, if we can hear you, we'd, we'd like to find you. I'm the, what is your name? Okay. Oh, uh, J Jason Brammer. Uh, okay. Jason's her oh, husband, yeah. and they work as a team like yeah. you and Carol did. You were on earlier. <laughs> there you um, go. I, I have a, a kind of a two-fold question. I was curious um, if there was, you, you, had, you had talked about the whole process of getting the commission and then getting contracts signed. <clears throat> I was curious, like, if there are other, if there's kind of a typical path that, goes from there, like in terms of the stages of the commission. And um, also it related to that, I'm curious, like, what kind of creative control do you typically have when you're creating a commissioned artwork? And how, how much input are you getting from the um, entity that's commissioning it versus they're giving you sort of more creative license to create based on what you feel? I'll talk to the first part. Um, the, the different stages. One thing 
I mean, there's just practical things. Like, you have to go through this process. It seems, I don't know why it takes so long. You think people would have a contract made up and use it over and over again, but that doesn't seem to happen. So the thing is, until you get that contract signed, you don't want to spend any money. Um, one, you're lucky if before the contract signed, they, they front you some money, but oftentimes they don't until the contract signed. So you can't go and order material because you don't want to put them out of pocket and then for some reason the contract never happens, which sometimes does happen. You know, the funding can be pulled. So you have to wait. Um, to, and that happened to us in Chattanooga. We had all this bronze to order, and I would not put the order in until I had that contract because I wasn't going to be out, you know, $100,000 or something. Um, so there's practical concerns about that. You know, if you, you know, if you just have a piece of already made that you're going to use, that's a different issue. Um, so that, the timeline is not always what you want. So the commission we're doing now, which are five paintings, um, we thought that we would get them done in the summer. And we set aside time, but we didn't have a contract till September. So we had to juggle a lot of things um, in order for that to happen. So there are these sorts of practical things. When you do your contract, they do it in stages in terms of getting paid. So, you know, you go through, you know, the con after the contract's done, you get money. After you're halfway through, you get money, you know, and you can work that out. But the money's an issue because you have to live and you count on getting that money. It's an incentive to get you to get your work done. Well, and, and a lot of the contracts that we see, especially in public art, is, is pretty much a vendor's contract. I mean, mm -hmm. if, you, if you've got a contract to put curbs in the university or, or a place, it's the same contract in some cases. It's not suited to, to, a, to an art contract, so it has to be rewritten sometimes. And there, there are, are times, and, and this addresses the second part of the question, that sometimes in a contract, There'll be like we we had to face one just recently where the uh, the person rewriting the contract after what we wrote decided that uh, in order to protect the institution we weren't allowed to make anything that remotely resembled what we were making even though what we were making is part of a history of what we've been doing for all these years but they wanted exclusivity they didn't they they don't know how to word it. But if we had signed that contract without really reading through that and changing it, we wouldn't be allowed to make most of the work we make because that contract would say you can't do it. They want an absolute unique thing. They also try sometimes to, to uh, get the copyright out of you. you know, they, they want the full copyright. They think they're buying it. It's their copyright. So the, a contract... That's why it's really important to have somebody you have a lawyer read it for you or to have somebody who's savvy about it um, look over everything because um, they, the contracts just get written. And the contract's the hardest part to go through. Once the contract's over, then you make, you make whatever you make and then you have the pitfalls that go into making things which are always there, but you know how to handle them. I mean, a major, a major sculptor told me that a major commission fell through because of that issue of ownership All right. uh, and uh, uh, not, you know, they were refusing to allow him to make a similar piece, you know, in a series, not exactly the same. What, what they're trying to say is they don't want an absolute duplicate, but, you know, even in, even in sculpture though, in, in casting, there's uh, an original is usually three pieces and that's, that's pretty much been the norm since the Renaissance. So, uh, you know, um, you see all these original Remingtons out there. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how many of the same pieces are original. Uh, and and uh, but to to address your your second point, uh, the uh, uh, you know I mentioned that that uh, Steve Oliver sort of requested things, and people will request 
you know, areas or places and things like that. But I think the really good commissions, they'll stay out of your way. They'll trust you and they'll look at that as a as, as some excitement. They don't know quite what it's going to be. Um, it, you know, and, and even in, you know, sometimes they talk about corporations being cold in dealing with artists. I once did something with Prudential Insurance. And I remember I, I built the sculpture, went through, had to go through all the hoops with, with Prudential. And this was out in Minnesota. And I get out there and I start to reassemble it. And I decide that I'd rather, I'd like to change it. So I called back to the home office, talked to the, to the two curators. And they hooked me up with the president. And I said, you know, that, that plan I gave you, what I wanted to build, I think I want to do it differently. And they, they responded, well, it's your art. Do what you want. And, you know, I thought that was um, really an amazing thing because I thought corporations said, that's what you propose, that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. But it's it's quite often not the case. There's a lot more trust that goes on between between things. I think the less somebody knows when they're contracting you or, or commissioning you, the, the more they have, you know, you know, really expectations. Uh, right. Usually it's in the form of budget. They well, how many commissions do you think you've done? For $10,000. <laughs> what, right. how, many, how many commissions have you done, do you think? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting, Paul. I, I don't think I've done a tremendous amount, uh, maybe a dozen. Um, but, you know, what those come from are the 30 or 40 large-scale temporary sculptures that, that were built that set a seed in somebody's mind for later on. Sort of like that kid you were talking about, Chris Fennell, huh? Yeah, that's right. exactly the same thing. I mean, I, I always used to tell people when they'd say, too bad you don't work in bronze. And I said, all those wooden pieces? And they'd say, yeah. And I said, well, they can be made out of bronze. <laughs> and I yep. think that temporary, the temporary pieces, you know, making a temporary sculpture or having two-dimensional work that's up temporarily is a really smart thing to do um, because that means that you have a commission um, and like everything, a show gets you another show, a commission gets you another commission. Um, they want to know that one of the things people want to know if they're going to give you money is that you know how to manage the money and get something completed. That's a big thing. You know, a lot of people don't know how to do that. Um, you, and you have to be accountable for it. So you know, I took care of all the art from McCormick, you know, and I said, well, you know, since I said, since we're going to use solely Illinois and Chicago artists, we can commission everything. And then I had to spend three hours convincing the committee that artists could be trusted. Uh -huh. yeah, so, you know, you are dealing with that mindset that says Absolutely. artists can't okay. do with money. You know, and obviously that's wrong. Are there any other questions anybody in the peanut gallery has before we wrap this up and move on? Bob, I see you there. Do you have any questions, Bob? Are the Rays going to win? No Rays. <laughs> All right. You guys go watch your baseball game. We're going to be here talking with Lauren, who's going to pick up in a second. Okay. I, Carol, Bob, I really appreciate your participation, your insight, your guidance. I guess the last question I have is none of these commissions you've done, there, there have been no horror stories? Um, yeah. Um, no, not really. It's it's all in the course of the process. I can think of one windfall that might have been interpreted as a horror story, Bob. Well, that was a windfall, as you said. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I'll tell that story later. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you guys are great. I really appreciate your participation tonight. Feel free to stick around, and um, you can get in your pajamas if you want. That's fine. And we we love you, and we thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. Okay, we love thank you, Paul. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'm gonna go look for Lauren. Lauren, Lauren, are you here? Can you hear me? Okay. Not I can sort of hear you, Lauren. Um I'm looking for you first though. There you are. All right, I see Lauren. Um Lauren you know, I don't know. I was gonna introduce you, but why don't you go ahead? Because you have more facets than I can cover. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, can everybody hear me? That's the first one. Yes. 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 
Um, I have prepared some things to, to go over tonight, but um, if at any point anybody's feeling like you want to move on to more advanced stuff or you have specific questions, please just jump in. If you could be a little louder, that would help me out. A little louder, okay. please. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of my background first. Can you hear me? Is that better? I'm, I'm good. Uh, a little better. I can hear you. Okay. Um, I can get speaker or uh, headphones if I need to. Um, that might take a minute, but so um, I've been in Chicago a very long time. I started working as a reporter and an editor in 1997, and at that same time also began working in galleries, um, specifically woman-made galleries. Um, I've been a food, beauty, and arts editor, and everything from a volunteer to curator, gallery director, um, gallery board member. And then in 2006, I traded reporting for grant writing and public relations and marketing. Um, but I'm also an exhibiting visual artist, and I do write my own proposals and press materials. So I understand this from both sides. Um, in terms of Chicago, um, Tony Fitzpatrick is my client, and uh, I write grants for Woman Made. I used to do their publicity. Um, Louder, please. Hello. Hello. So they want you louder. Uh, Maybe just, I, I can barely hear you. Because I'm, I'm speaking pretty loudly, and if you can't hear me, then. Okay. Um, I, can, I can hear you. Teresa, are you having the problem? No, I'm not having any problems. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm speaking pretty loudly, so I don't know what else to do aside from that. <clears throat> Go ahead. Who's having a hard time? Erin? Yeah. What? Could I, this is Erin. I just had a, a quick question. Could you, um, you, you were talking about doing grant writing. I'm not exactly sure what that means. Feels okay. Like. Good question. Um, we'll we'll yeah. go over a few things tonight. Um, and again, just pop in with questions if you need to, um, and Paul, you too. So grant writing, for instance, um, I recently wrote a grant for artist Chris Antiman, and it's for the group grant, and it was a $30,000 prize. So, how do, you, um, how do you spell her last name? The artist or the, yeah. um, the, the artist? A-N-T-E-M-A-N-N. -E -N -N. How much, well, I guess this is off topic, but when, when you get a chance in the future, how much do you charge people to write their grants? <laughs> Like, is that enough to live off of to support your art? I do. Yes, I do. Um, I will get to that at, at the end. So um, let me back up to um, sort of the three things that we'll cover tonight. Um, I wanted to give you editorial and publicity for Artists 101. If, if this is too basic for anybody, I apologize and bring me your questions at the end. Um, so you've got my background, and make some notes as we go along here so I can make sure I answer all your questions. And if I don't, find me on Facebook. <laughs> um, so when you are writing, um, let's, con let's think that we're writing um, either your statement, a grant, an exhibition proposal. And Erin, to quickly answer your question, if I didn't, um, a grant is an application for funds pretty much. Um, it can be a competition. Um, it's like writing a public art application, an exhibition proposal, except instead of getting an exhibition, you're getting funds. Um, and it relates back to what um, they were just speaking about and being accountable for the money. And I can get into that later. Um, grants and grant writing <coughs> um, is a huge thing. I can focus on that if people would rather hear about that than publicity. Um, no, oh, I think, for me anyway, I think the covering the broad is, is terrific. Yeah, that okay. gives us a starting point. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to be able to not only speak about your work, but to write about it. Um, of course, no matter what your art form is, doing the art form the best of your ability is tremendously important, and then having amazing images of it. And I say that because I've curated many shows um, and juried many shows where people are sending in photos with like their cat tails and you know in front of the painting. 
<laughs> so it's um, very important to have great images. But it's nearly equally as important to have good editorial. So what I mean by editorial is good writing, a good artist statement, a good bio statement, um, your resume, and depending on what you're applying for, your resume is slightly less important than your proposal. So the two things I want to focus on are how to craft a stellar, well, three things, a stellar statement and a proposal, <coughs> and um, then you can apply those things also to publicity, okay? So um, if you've gone to art school, there's a lot of focus on the theoretical and the philosophical and um, a lot of high-minded, a lot of high-mindedness, which is fun and exciting, but it doesn't translate very well um, when you're sending a proposal to a committee who does not know you, um, or you're sending out a press release to a reporter that um, really might have a thousand other things to cover. So let's start with some things not to do. And this applies, again, to all three. Uh, when you, despite what you may have heard or what you read or, or what you learned in, in grad school, um, applications for funds, applications for exhibitions and press releases and even your statements is not the place for experimental grammar or oblique narrative um, with lots of, uh, lots of really heady words that people have to spend a long time thinking about. So you want to avoid the theoretical and really obtuse sentences. Um, I can give you some examples too at the end of, uh, in a little bit what I mean by that. You want to avoid pontificating. Um, you also want to avoid telling the viewer or the reader what they're going to experience or understand from your work. It sets you up automatically in an argument. For instance, um, I see many statements where artists will say or write or say things like, um, the viewer will understand from my work, or the viewer will experience from my work. You're telling them what they're going to get out of it, and it automatically makes them not want to. Um, people are really uh, cranky and cantankerous. You know, if you've ever waited for somebody to pull out of their parking space, you know, they're going to argue with you about it, you know? So um, avoid that sort of oblique um, language. And also, and this, I can't stress this enough, you must edit, must, must, must edit. Um, everything that you write, everything that I write, the first time it comes out, it's terrible. It's horrible. Rewrite it. Edit it. Edit it so much. Edit it again. Ask for help. Um, get the contact information of the people you're in this workshop with and, and, and edit things together. Um, it's very time consuming. And when you're doing it, you think, shit, oh my God, this is never going to end. But it's going to save you a lot of time um, when it comes to crunch time. And let's say, you know, in the fall, there's lots of applications for residencies to do. It'll save you tons of time if you have a really coherent, cohesive statement and you can just plug it in. Some to-do um, points that I want to mention. And when I go through, after I go through all this, then we'll have a little like, Q&A and we'll get to specific examples and things like that. <coughs> the to-do, um, as I said, I was a journalist and there was probably one rule, which is KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. If uh, you're starting to get really wound up about what you're writing, dial it back down. The average reading level in the United States is eighth grade. And um, I think it's probably even less than that if you read community newspapers. Um, delete unnecessary words. Um, again, art, and I'm not art school bashing, but um, a lot of my clients come to me out of art school and they're really lost in their thought process and in their writing process. And it, it's very lengthy and it's kind of difficult to read. So delete, your un, delete unnecessary words. And the next, the two, um, two next state points are really important. So above all, you want to craft a clean, coherent narrative. 
narrative sort of gets a bad word, um, has a bad rap in the art market. But in terms of your writing, you want people, you want your writing to read like the back of a, of a novel. You want people to want to keep reading. You're trying to lure them in. So craft a clean, coherent narrative that compels people to read further. But most importantly, know your audience. For example, if you're writing a grant, um, for instance, I'll, I'll use Chris Antonin, the artist that, um, that I just wrote the grant for. Um, it was the Groot grant. Groot as in the garbage people here in Chicago. Um, they have a foundation and they give out three annual awards. Uh, first prize to a 3D artist, meaning someone making sculptures, is $30,000. Um, and it's, uh, you, you don't have to account for what you do with the money. So it's an unrestricted grant. That's a huge windfall to an artist. Um, I think the next amount is 20 and then either 15 or 10. Um, you can see the second place winner at um, Ann Nathan Gallery. If you know Christina Cordova's work, she was the second place winner this year. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, the third place, I'm sorry. Anyway, so Chris um, was the first place winner, and what she did was she sent me her notes. And this is the benefit of having someone, even if it's not uh, a professional, but someone who is objective about your work and can give you some objective feedback about your writing, um, they're invaluable. Um, your husband, your um, best friend, really. Um, they can give you feedback that is honest. So she sent me um, about 10 or 12 pages of notes. You know, the kinds of notes that we all take, they're rambling, they don't make any sense, they're full of our inspirations and ideas and concepts. She sent that to me, and it was my job to take all of that and get it down into a one-page first draft. So it, you can probably imagine it's really difficult to do as an artist. It's difficult for me to do it myself for my own work. Um, so I sort of have to split myself in two when I do that. Um, and um, what I had to do was read between the lines in the group grant application. So I had to figure out what the grant or the agency giving the money was looking for. If, um, and if you just, you can read any sort of grant, read a couple grant applications. Read the NEA versus Creative Capital. They're two different organizations seeking to fund two different types of um, artists or public works or, or anything like that. What I mean by know your audience is <coughs> You are, if you haven't done the research into who you're sending your application to, it will come across an application. And the committee, who doesn't know you from Adam or Eve, um, they might not look so kindly on it. In fact, they won't. If it doesn't flow very well, if it's not crisp, concise, if you don't make the argument that you, above all these other people, deserve the money or deserve the show, or whatever. So it's helpful to do a lot of research before you start um, submitting and crafting your proposal for anything. Who will be looking at this information? Um, if it's an exhibition, is it going to be um, just the gallery director? Could you go in and talk to the gallery director? Or is it going to be a committee of people who will go through your slides so quickly um, that um, they may never get to the application. Or do they divide them up between 20 people and, and this group looks at the printed materials and this group looks at the images. So there's lots of different um, ways that money is awarded and that um, exhibitions come to happen. Um, sorry, I, so, I sort of got... Let me interrupt you while you sit there a second, Lon. Um I think, you know, when I had a gallery and people would bring work in or slides in for me to take a look at, you know, I could always tell if they were familiar with the gallery or not. So many of these things I equate to dating, you know, and on, on a first date, you typically don't spend a lot of time talking about eighth grade, you know, you spend time talking about what's current. 
And, you know, you sort of want to present yourself, you know, you, you sort of need to know something when you're dealing with a gallery or this grant writing or commissions, you have to have some knowledge about the per the people you want to be working with. And if you are interested in them, or better put, if they get a sense that you are interested in them, they're more likely to be interested in you. This is a lot, a lot, a lot about relationships. The art world is really small. You can know half of everybody in the art world pretty easily. Couldn't say the same thing about, you know, cars. Um, right. Right. So, Lauren, I'm going to turn it back to you now. Right. No, that's, that's very true. And Facebook and uh, social media is certainly connecting us all a lot more. Um, okay. So, um, backing up to when, when I mentioned that... Um, <clears throat> Sorry, is every, I'm hearing a button. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> I think we're okay. Okay. So backing up to when I said that um, it's important to have people that you trust to bounce your ideas off of when you're um, putting these materials together. Um, I'll give you an example. I talked to a, a new um, client, new artist yesterday, and um, I gave him a call. He knew that I would be calling, and he said, oh, I've never done this before. And I thought, well, I said, you mean you've never talked about your artwork before? And he said, no, not over the phone. And so that made me start thinking, just yesterday made me think about this conversation that we're having today and how important it is to pick up what Paul just said, have conversations. So if you, um, if you have not spent much time outside of your studio talking to people about what you're doing, it can be problematic on a number of levels. One, um, from a publicist's point of view, you need to be able to get down what we call the elevator speech, which is uh, in the amount of time that it would take you to ride down or ride up to the 40th floor with, say, a curator at the MCA. Uh, somebody at Creative Capital, you know, um, a, a person that you never knew their name, but suddenly you're in the elevator with a, you know, a editor of art form. Then how do you, in the time it would take you to get up to the 40th floor, explain your work? That is really a lot more difficult than it sounds. The best way to get that down is to talk to people. Um, journalists, too, they're going to want to talk to you. Sometimes granting committees, and if you've gone through the graduate school process, you know you could be called up for a phone interview or to come in and talk in person. Those conversations can lead to good writing. So when you're having those conversations, um, listen to yourself. <laughs> it's, it's difficult to be self-aware and uh, take, you know, taking notes and being sort of coherent at the same time. But, um, Anybody who's a parent can figure out <laughs> how to do it. So having those conversations can lead to the aha moment in your writing, which is clarity, again, going back to clarity and cohesion, and that can lead to many more opportunities. Like, um, was it Carol that was just on? Was that her name? Right. Carol Mickett? Yep. She said that... Um, the, you know, one, a good show leads to another show. Well, it's the same thing with grants and, mm -hmm. and, and proposals. Once you get it down, you can take off. And you can send out, like a Daryl Roberts, who's an artist in Chicago, he applied for 200 things one year, and he got a good return rate. He got 10% uh, of everything that he applied for. And he just went nuts and applied for everything. But he had all his materials set up, and he had a really good um, explanation for what it is that he does. And it allowed him to just run with it. Um, okay. Now I've talked a little bit about the writing, and I would like to um, talk about getting media attention for a minute here. Does anybody have any questions, though? None just yet? Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay, so Lauren? getting media attention. Um, Lauren? 
Yeah. Hi, it's Erin again. Hi, Erin. Um, hi. Um, you mentioned, I was just trying to get down the names of some of these uh, grant organizations. I, I know the Creative Capital and I think you were talking about National Endowment. Oh, yeah, NEA. Um, was there, was there I wouldn't bother name? with the NEA right now because they don't fund individual artists anymore. Um, oh. it, it is, however, very helpful to read their application. Um, the questions that they ask can really help you think long term. Okay? So, Erin, um, do you live in Chicago in the city? Yes. One of the first ones that you might want to start with is the CAP grant. The CAP? C A A P. If you just type in the Chicago Artist Grant, you'll find it. Okay. Um, there are there are a number of different resources, and I'd be happy to com um, compile a short list and um, send it to Paul, and he can email it to everybody if that sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, great. Sounds like, yeah, sure. Okay, great. Hold on. Some people are having difficulty hearing, so I'm going to mute everybody and then unmute you, Lauren, and then I'm going to have to look for people to raise their hands if they want to talk. So hold on. I'm muting everybody, and now. Lauren is unmuted. Okay. Andrew, I hope that makes it easier for you to hear. Lauren, take it away. Okay, great. And um, Andrew, I, I will send these notes that I have made. I'll send them to Paul, too, and he can send them out to you guys. And then you can just, um, it might trigger, a, you know, a memory about what I was talking about. So in terms of media attention and how to get media attention, there's no, there's no magic bullet. Um, but I will go back to what I said earlier about knowing your audience. First, you need to know yourself. You need to be really honest with yourself. Um, and I, as an artist, I can tell you this is very hard sometimes. Be very honest with yourself about what um, sort of publications you fit into. There's many, many, many different um, art publications, online, um, there's blogs, there's I, everything. But to figure out where you belong um, in terms of what you make is going to help you get into the pages uh, or the pixels of that magazine a lot easier. So there are some tips, however, um, even though there's no magic bullet, there's some tips for being more successful. And after you've been doing it long enough um, and you get a few blurbs uh, and then you start to get some reviews, you'll understand who wants what and why they want it. So even in the age of media overload, people are still afraid of journalists. But I am here to tell you to not be afraid of journalists. Um, they need you to fill their pages as much and to get a paycheck as much as you need them to get a blurb or review. And many of the um, writers in the major art magazines, they freelance. So um, they need to find good artists and good shows that they can write about so that, again, they can make a paycheck. Um, it's a fine line between uh, being in touch with them and pestering them. Um, sometimes you have to cross that line to learn what the line is. Um, but I want to give you now some tips about getting media attention. Let me interrupt you again a second, Lauren, yeah. please. <clears throat> you know, I started writing this art letter a number of years ago, and I was really flattered the first time somebody said to me, Paul, this is off the record. Um, I thought that was pretty cool. But, you know, it's, again, it's all about relationships. And I think my art letter is at the extreme of non-purity. You know, I mean, I will write a nice – unfortunately, I ended up getting the reputation of only saying nice things in my art letter. And I'm kind of burdened with that and because I'm nowhere near as nice a guy as I seem to be, at least there. Um, I, I remember a few years ago, you, you weren't writing nice things. I remember that. I can. That was just about Rashid. Um, and, um, but I, it, the point is, though, that if I like somebody, I'll go write about their show, you know, and I'm totally comfortable with the absence of purity there. But I think other art critics or whatever I, I am, um, you know, if they like somebody, they're going to try and do them a favor. They're probably going to have to, I mean, John Storr gets busted all the time for writing about students and people he's hiring and, and, and not disclosing that. You know, and he's pretending to be fair and equitable. I'm not. 
But regardless, people are out there wanting to do favors for people they like. I mean, I think it's human nature. If there's right. some art critic you like, you're going to try and be nice to them. Same thing. Be nice to people. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. And like you said, the art, the art world's way too small to, you know, not, um, not be connected with people. True. Uh, that way. And so it's, that again reinforces the statement to not don't be afraid of journalists because um, one you're going to have another show and two you're going to be out of print real soon so if they if somebody gives you a bad review it doesn't matter it goes away in a little while um, now I'm I'm saying that as a publicist not as somebody receiving a bad review um, but talking about oh well I'm going to touch on blogs real quick. Um, you mentioned about the purity thing. There's a lot of hullabaloo right now uh, because there are many, many bloggers that are being paid. And um, they get endorsements, they get products, whatever. And people are taking great offense at this. Um, I don't have an opinion on it one way or another because um, I don't pay off bloggers. Um, but, I, but I need bloggers, so, you know, we'll see, we'll see where it goes. Um, I don't know if anybody here does blog, and if you do, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about it. Um, but there's a, the Internet is shifting. 2.0 is quickly becoming something else. Um, you know, Facebook wants to be its own Internet, and it's kind of succeeding in the way that you, it, that you can use it. <coughs> there's, just, there's so many changes happening so rapidly. It's kind of hard to have that purity and so I think the way to do it is to have full disclosure there's a lot of blogs that um, they just right off the bat give you know they say full disclosure this person is you know I went to grad school with this person or I talked to this person at a conference six years ago it's really hard to not know somebody so um, let's talk about the people that you don't well even if you do know them this still holds true and if you do know somebody and they don't want to give you a review, uh, don't get mad at them. <laughs> they, they might um, be saving you for another time. They might be, if there's any number of reasons that they might not want to review you. Don't I need to interrupt them. again. I think it's really important when you want to review, when you get a review, when you want to be included in an exhibit, when you apply for a grant and you don't get it, do not take these things personally. Right. It is not about you. It is about your art. And I need to say two more things. As an art dealer, when people would bring me their art, it wasn't about really whether I liked it or not. It was about whether I agreed with it. It was like whether it fit the direction I thought my gallery wanted to go in. If I already had somebody doing what you do, I don't need you. If, you know, if you're doing something that's similar or that's related, then I do need you. You know, and a lot of galleries have different criteria for what they need. I wanted people who had different price points, and I wanted people from different ages, ethnicities, and, lo and, lo and locales. You know, some people only want Chicago. Some people only want people with big reputations. We talked to Kavi a while ago. You know, he has a specific way that he's looking. It's the same thing that Lauren was pointing out earlier. You know, if you're going to have a relationship with somebody, you should know something about them and, you know, steer what you do to the right people. Sorry to interrupt. No, 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 it's fine. It's, this is, it's, it's all good. I like to, this is like, you know, we're creating our own little web of information here. Cool. Um, so, to, um, this is a general, this is a general briefing about, about the media. We could have an entire 10-week um, course on, you know, writing, writing to get journalists' attention but you literally have three seconds to get their attention. So that's why I emphasize um, being concise so much. Um, you know, it's like a, a copy editor, of which I was one. Um, you're on the desk at two in the morning and you've got 15 minutes to get six pages done and to the press. You don't have time to, to, to mess around. Um, and there's, there are so few journalists anymore um, and I'm talking about traditional journalists and good bloggers. Um, there's actually so few of them that they have even less time. So, um, again, 
um, being concise and being coherent. Uh, great photos are still important to get printed in the glossies, of course, um, and also for review at, in galleries and, and grants and things like that. Um, less stellar photos can still get you online coverage um, because it's sort of limitless space. When you are sending out to an online publication, your photos are the most important thing, but even more important than your text that you've written. Um, but great video is the, is the printed image of our age. So if there's any way that you can create good video, then I would do it. Um, we have a, a YouTube channel that has, uh, uh, we created a video for Tony Fitzpatrick's play at Steppenwolf, uh, and which we sold out, partially because of this video. So, um, and he's got a book coming out about the, um, the art and the writing that he made for this train, and we'll also do a video for that. So think creatively. There's a lot of, um, and I'll send some links to Paul too to share with you. There are a lot of really creative videos happening right now, and that's another way to promote your work. Um, look at Nick Cave's website right now, um, the um, pop-up shop. He's, he's the um, head of the fashion department at Art Institute and the creator of the sound suit. You probably know his work even if you don't know his name. He has an amazing website, absolutely amazing. Super expensive, <laughs> but if you can think creatively like that, that's one way and start going viral. Um, tips, again, uh, tips on writing to the media. Most journalists want emails. Um, there are some rare birds who still want mail or faxes. Again, relationships. Call and find out how they want it. Um, Margaret Hawkins, a writer who is um, on the, in, lives in the North Shore here in Chicago, notoriously, pri notoriously private. Um, whereas somebody like um, some of the writers for Fiber Arts, they're on Facebook and you can contact them on Facebook. So again, it's about knowing, um, feeling out, taking a look at, researching first how people will want to be communicated with. Um, don't be afraid to friend journalists online. Um, you know, there's lots of writers for Freeze and, and other great magazines that I'm friends with on Facebook. I would not, however, pitch them on Facebook. I wouldn't try to get a story out of them through Facebook. I would find out how they want that done. If they're okay with it on Facebook, fine. But um, don't, you know, don't promote yourself through other people's personal Facebook pages. Um, Again, stellar images, send low res images and let them know that you have high res available. Another trick for this is to send one or two low res images and follow up with a third. Uh, journalists like options, they like options a lot. Um, again, know the publication and if you don't know it, you can be ignored. Um, so again, what we were talking about earlier, in relating to the three seconds, be quick and to the point. Be direct, know what you want, and ask for it, and you will probably get it. Um, for instance, go pick up any magazine that you have laying around the house, and uh, they have different sections. Um, every news website and, and even blogs, they all have different sections. If you, for instance, got to the point in your career where you wanted to be in Vanity Fair, you're having a show uh, in New York or in Brooklyn or something, you would be in the front portion of the magazine. Know the magazine or know the publication well enough to say, I think my work would fit here and this is why. Um, so you're making the argument always that look at my images, they're awesome, I know what I'm doing and, and this is why I would like to be in your magazine and why I would like to work with you. And if they say no or if they don't get in touch with you, follow up again later. Keep following up until you are told, don't ever contact me again. And hopefully you never hear that, but um, most people, you know, would not say that to you. Well, let me interrupt again. Sure. I also think it's okay for any of you to just send an image or two images and say something like, I'm not having a show, but I'm going to within the next 12 months or whenever, and I'd like you to have some familiarity with my work now. And I'm not asking for anything, and I'll be back in touch in a number of months. 
Yeah, I think that's a great idea, Paul. And it's especially a great idea because depending on your publication, you're looking at a six to nine month lead time sometimes. Um, if you, you know, if you wanted Chicago Magazine to do a little write up on your show, which they totally would. Um, right now it's October, they're already working on March. So um, at least March, maybe April. So again, it, it, know the publication. Um, and yeah, Paul, that's a great idea. Also, don't be afraid to send your images to the art director of everything. Um, unless their website specifically says, don't send us stuff. There are lots of... Um, lots what of is it going to hurt even if you do send it? Right. That's, well, that's true. Um, having been one of the editors on the other side, though, if, if, if there is specifically someone saying, do not send me something, and you do, you will probably never make it in with that editor. So, okay. um, yeah. Um, but send to the art directors, especially like the New York Times Magazine, um, <laughs> Decor Magazine, uh, you know, they, they like to use different types of art for illustration. They use sculpture in the New York Times Magazine to illustrate their articles. So, um, this sounds silly but I'll tell you a personal story for why I always say this. Um, get the appropriate editor's name and spell the name correctly, and or the gallery, whoever. Um, I used to, I worked for a number of galleries in, in River North, and at various times, the names were spelled so terribly, so horribly wrong that it was, it, it's offensive. Um, and my first story that I ever wrote um, as, a, as a journalist, I was right out of high school, and I was covering uh, um, a memorial service for 19 um, soldiers who were killed in Vietnam, and they were all like you know, 19, 20 years old in a small community in Indiana. And I took, I took um, the, the word of the funeral director, and I just listened to him and, and wrote down all their names. Every one of their names was wrong. So... That was a huge mistake, and I should have been fired, but they gave me another chance. So make sure that you spell people's names correctly. It seems like a small thing, but it's not. Um, don't send out every bit of material that you've ever uh, produced, that you've ever written, that you've ever um, had photographed. Be selective. Make them want more. And again, um, and this will sort of end uh, my, my tips and my plan to discussion, and we can move into what you want to ask. Be objective with yourself and about yourself. As Paul said, uh, remove your emotions. There's, none of it is personal at all. Chris Antiman, who applied for the group grant twice, did not get it until someone else, me, wrote the uh, grant for her. So I could put her through a filter, and she was told it was the... Um, it was the grant narrative that got her the grant this time, even though her work had been stellar for years. When you're thinking about the questions, when I, I forgot what I was going to say. You were talking about that. Um, I just lost it. <laughs> Sorry. All right. I'm going to unmute everybody. And um, I think my software is running slowly, so I'm not sure I can see everybody and everything, but at this point, everybody's I have a question. Unmuted. Can anyone hear who's, me? Yes, who's that, it's Vicky? Vicky? It's Vicky. Um, I was wondering about that, that old uh, saying that any press is good press when people get bad reviews and they're like, it's okay. It, any press is good press, but I'm wondering how true that is if you get a horrible review and then you get another horrible review. <laughs> Is that really true, or is it is it better if, you know, I mean, obviously it's better if you get good reviews, but is that, that whole idea that if your name's out there, even if it's horrible, it's okay? They're talking about you. Yeah. But, it's, yeah, it's, but you could I, be like a pariah <laughs> or known as like a really. Likely. You could be. here. Here's how I would handle that. We live in a very um, PC world right now, uh -huh. so nobody's going to slaughter you. If they do, you know, 
it might be time to look at your work. But if they give um, if they give honest, good critical feedback, it's not mm -hmm. going to be all positive. And you wouldn't want somebody to just unnecessarily lavish praise on you. Right. In my opinion. But I see sometimes people take negative reviews and they just hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, Vicky, stop. I'm going to have to mute everybody except you, and then I'm going to have to switch people around here because I guess we'll try that. Vicky, go ahead. I'm going to I, you know, I'm, go ahead. I I've just noticed like we have a theater company in our space right now, and they're getting a review, and they're like, well, even if it's bad, our name's out there, our name's out there, and I'm kind of like, well. I've seen people take bad reviews and run with them, and that's, I guess, I'm asking in that capacity that is it something that you want buried when you do get the better review, or is it good to hang on to it, or do you know, do you know what I'm trying to say? Because they somehow yeah. feel like just because they're being written out about it, it's good, but I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Well, um, it's, it's both. It's a double-edged sword. It's, it's good that somebody took the time to come review you. Mm -hmm. um, or that. Truthfully, there's so much happening, especially in a city like Chicago or New York or any other big metropolitan area. There's so much happening at any given time that for somebody to say, I'm going to review this, that does mean something. Um, okay. If they didn't like it, that also means something. That means that they cared enough to still write about it because they could have just said, screw this. I'm not writing about this at all. This wasn't worth my time. Mm -hmm. However, you don't really want to put it in the portfolio. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Tony might kill me for telling you this, but he got totally, totally raked over the coals by the theater reviewer at the Tribune. The very next day, the theater Chris reviewer, Jones. Uh, yeah, Chris Jones. Um, very next, but and part of that is because Chris Jones doesn't understand America, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, Hetty White came back and and gave it an amazing review, and also almost counterpointed Chris's review point by point. Mm -hmm. So it is not automatically a bad thing. We're not putting Chris's review in any of the publicity kits. Um, we didn't really talk about it that much, um, but especially because there were other reviews coming out at the same time. There were lukewarm reviews that happened too. Um, we just didn't play them up as much. Mm -hmm. If it's the only review that you get, here's how I would handle it. Um, I would write the journalist and say thank you for coming. I would CC their editor, and I would ask to have a letter of response printed. Um, so in other words, be proactive on your own behalf. If you think whatever they're, if you get a bad review, and, you, and this applies to anybody or any theater thing or anything. If you and visual art it, also? Visual art, absolutely. If you think it was unfair, counter it. And you have a million ways to do that now, Twitter, Facebook, anything. If you if you really think you've been treated unfairly, and, and they missed the mark, and they just didn't get it, and maybe they were incompetent, and they were not the person that should have been reviewing your um, work because they didn't understand it. Like Chris Jones just doesn't have the history of Americana to understand what this train was about. Then you should come back and request a letter. And if, if the letter isn't printed, put it on your website, put it on your blog. Um, look at 16th Street Theater. Ann, Ann Filmer, the director for this train, did a response to Chris Jones. And she put it on the website. So you could do something like that. All right, I'm going to unmute okay. everybody again so that we can see who else has questions. Everybody's now <laughs> unmuted. Teresa, you have a question? Um, I have a question wait, 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 wait. Let me mute, wait. Let me mute everybody again. And unmute. Wait. Unmute Teresa. All right, Teresa, go away. Take it away. I have a question regarding statements and elevator speech. Um, it's about the content. Would you suggest someone focus on the process of their work or the content of their work? What do you think is a more um, well, the better approach. Depends on what kind of artist you are. Tell me about your art. Well, I'm, I'm, um, I paint and draw two-dimensional, 2D work mostly. Um, yeah, it's pretty layered process, but it has a really strong personal content. So sometimes I think that telling the personal content doesn't seem to talk about the work the best. 
and doesn't allow people to experience it without a bias. So, okay. <clears throat> Again, um, th one, this is where the research would come in. But if it's sort of impromptu, where you know where you would encounter this person, um, try to read them is the best thing I can offer. <laughs> If they back up from you and you start talking about the personal content and just start nodding, then I would switch to process. Um, but what the, the biggest question is, what's the most important part of your work? Are they both equally important? And again, this is <coughs> um, can you can you talk about one without talking about the other? Really, which one is the most important? And you'd have to decide that because you wouldn't want to misrepresent what you do to somebody and then they want to see it and they it's not what they were expecting at all you know what i mean so if you you know if you you if you arc weld or something on your drawings if you you know if it's uh, really heavily processed then that's what you should focus on does that answer your question it does very well thank you okay. i'm muting unmuting everyone again unmute all all right then <coughs> this is jill Hi, Joe. Hi, Lauren. Uh, this is maybe a small question, but uh, hold on a sec, Jill. Jill, hold on. Let me let me mute everybody again and unmute Jill. Jill, you are now unmuted. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for this because I wish I had heard you speaking or talked to you ten years ago. But <laughs> it's nice to be doing it. Um, this is kind of a little thing, and it might be silly, but when you were talking about sending off to publications, even the big ones, the national publications, just to the art directors to get their images, and, um, if they use an image, do you, is it purely for publicity, or would, uh, for yourself, I mean the artist, or could you expect to be paid? Should you expect to be paid? You should expect to be paid. Um, if... Um, so, for example, I don't know, um, Jill. What are you? Uh, what kind of work do you do? I'm a painter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you decided that you wanted to do a series of paintings about onions, and you decided that you wanted to send it to Cook's Magazine, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you should expect to hear back from them within six to nine months, either pro or con, and um, you should then expect to receive a contract. There is something, if you're interested, if any of you are interested in this, there's something called the Illustrator's Market, and it's a really good all-in-one book that um, gives you an idea of when the deadlines are, how realistic it is that they uh, will take unsolicited artwork. There are zillions of publications that your work can go out to, and they pay anywhere from, you know, a small, 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 small compensation to a lot of money so um, it just sort of depends but they should not be using your work uh, for free at all uh, right. yeah and if, if they do that means they're giving you a review <laughs> so if they're using it to illustrate an article um, or on their cover you should get paid I see Vicky raising her hand literally. Not, I, can't, I, I can't see everybody, but I can see Vicky. So I'm going to unmute everybody and let Vicky speak. Vicky, go ahead. This is in reference to, to Jill's question. Is this what would fall under the term licensing? And should we have our rates set ourselves before, like when they approach us, say we want this much for this image, or do you wait for them to contact you and offer, make you a deal? Um, and do you, do you have to know licensing contracts that you're not taken advantage of? Um, okay, so um, again, this is where the handbook will come in um, handy. Uh, just about everybody is, that's reputable is listed in that book. You can get it at your library. Hold on, I'm gonna, I've got to mute everybody again. And Lauren, I want you to repeat that. I'm sorry. Um, what handbook are you talking about? Wait a minute, you can't. I can't hear you when you talk, though. So you are unmuted. What, ha what handbook? Okay, it's the Illustrator's Guide to Markets, or the Illustrator's Market. I think it's Illustrator's Market, and they come out with one every year and they update their listings. Um, and this, you know, it, 
this is it's a great opportunity. There's lots of places that are looking for collage. There's, so you could sell your studies. You could sell your, um, if you're playing around on Photoshop, if you're playing around on iPhone, and, make, and you're doing your drawings that way, um, you can sell these. So, um, and again, it's a matter of finding where you fit in um, and what publications you're interested in. So um, to, get, to get back to your question, look in that book. Um, it gives you, that book breaks it down for you. It gives you an idea of how much they pay, um, when they pay it out to you, the contract, all that sort of thing. You wouldn't have to worry about licensing unless you were selling your work to an agency that's going to resell it and resell it and resell it. Um, you, you have to be a little further along in the illustration field before you get to that point. Um, if all of you are making original works of art, don't even worry about that. You know, you want it to be a one-off or something. Don't worry about it. But if you're doing print, um, then then you start worrying about it. Um, but again, to reference that book, it has a lot of legal coaching in it. And should you ever get to the point where you need more legal coaching on anything, um, you can always call the lawyers for the creative arts here in Chicago, and they will help you go over contracts um, for a really small, small fee. They're a nonprofit. That's a good reference, Lawyers for the Creative Arts, and they, they've contacted me a number of times about this course, going, what can we do, what can we do, can we help? And I don't know that they're doing anything that I don't feel like I've got covered elsewhere, but they are a good resource and they're available to you. Yeah, they're a great resource for all kinds of things. And they have a website and they're right in River North, so um, yeah, check them out. All right, I'm going to unmute everybody again. See if anybody else has got a question. The question. I've got, I've got a question. This is Jess. Is that Sarah? No, this is Jess. Uh, Sarah. Oh, Jess, okay. Yeah. Wait a minute, Jess. Uh, I'm going to mute everybody again. Hold okay. on a second. And then I'm going to unmute you. You are now unmuted. Go ahead. Okay. I live downstate, um, not in Chicago. And what the people downstate are a lot of physicists and engineers and musicians, and they're from all over the world. And those are the people I've been talking to. And I find there's a real disconnect between the co what communicates well with physicists and engineers and what communicates well in the art world. And I practice talking to the wrong people if I'm going to try and write art grants. But it seems like there ought to be something that I could do with that. I, I don't know what to do with this conversation I've started. It doesn't connect to the art world. Okay, I know exactly what to do with it. <laughs> there is oh a, um, Jess, hold on, I'm gonna make a note. Um, I am losing the link, I, I'm losing the name of it, but I'm on their mailing list. There is a, uh, a center for exactly what you're talking about. Um, it's, it's business and, and scientists and artists, all three combined. Um, so the physicists will pair up with the artists, or the artists are the physicists, and um, they they have a big conference every year. They have exhibitions around the world. Um, they publish things, and I am totally forgetting their name right now. So I'm gonna I'll get that to you through Paul, um, or you can find me again. You can find me on Facebook. And um, uh oh, I went to sleep. Sorry. <laughs> you can find me on Facebook, and um, and I'll get you that. And there's also another place um, for anybody else who's interested in the arts and sciences called the Institute for Figuring. Their website is the, T-H-E-I-F-F dot org. And they're in California. And they also do a lot of uh, the types of things that you're talking about. Say, say that again, please. Their, their uh, website. Um, oh, it's the, like the, the word, the. Yeah. I. Hmm. It's not that my work is technological or anything, but it tends to speak to the engineers and scientists what, what their work doesn't give them, what they're hungry for often. I would, I'd have to see it to be able to give you more feedback on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
and I, I don't know if you're on Facebook, but again, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to, you know, give you a little bit more advice um, outside of the conversation here. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, I'm going to unmute everybody else and see if anybody else has got a question. Um, hold on. Everybody now can talk. This is Sarah. I have a question. Go for it. Wait a minute. I'm unmuting. I'm yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, Sarah, you can speak now. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay. Um, as an art director, I'm, I'm very familiar with this book of which you speak. Um, and... I, I would feel, as an artist, though, uncomfortable having my art in a book like that that would be used for commercial purposes. Um, and I, I know of people who are artists that have had their work uh, used in, you know, as illustrations for, you know, a Cracker Barrel ad. And it really, really was a pretty bad thing. And I just, Paul, what do you think? I think it's a pretty... As an artist, is that is that a damaging thing to your career? I don't think it's something I would want to do. I think it really all depends, and it's like branding, you know. And yeah. Nick Cave, who was mentioned earlier, has opened up, you know, a sound a suit. I mean, a shop next door to his place, and they had the opening because. Oh, what magazine was Nicky reproduced in? Lauren, do you remember? It was, it was Vogue. Uh, yeah. Vogue. So there's a 17-page yeah. section of Nick Cave's people dressed in sound suits holding purses. You know, and my first reaction is to sort of recoil, and then my second reaction yeah. is, is, well, you know, Nick is head of the fashion department, you know, not the art department at the School of the Art Institute, and he's a smart man, and he knows what he's doing, and he feels like the exposure is good for him, you know. I think it really depends on who it is. You know, Lauren was talking about Tony Fitzpatrick. I got an email from Tony today who's converting his, he's moving out of his studio. And as you guys know, who was at his home last week, he's putting a studio in his house. And he's going to use the studio as a gallery to work with young artists and take no percentage, but make money as a result of selling swag, you know, t-shirts, posters, and books. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's really a delicate question, Sarah, as to, you know, for each so artist maybe to decide you have and to have be very control. targeted in how you do it so that you don't damage yourself by selling out. Right. Well, right, and I'm certain that sometimes you don't have control. Yeah, right. You know, the and only that, control you have is to not participate, not send it in. Right. Exactly, because now I don't know who's, who this artist was, but it, if you're an art director and you, you're working on a place at a place that's on the up and up and – Certainly, I worked at a fashion magazine where we literally took off Elizabeth Hurley's stomach and replaced it with somebody who had better abs. Mm -hmm. um, we were threatened with a lawsuit, and that's as far as it went. So, um, but we had to pull all the magazines off the shelves. If you're Elizabeth Hurley, you have recourse like that, and if you're not, well, that's where lots of research comes in. And um, don't uh, certainly Google, 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 Google everything, because you're going to find horror stories out there. If you're, if you, so if you get the publication that I was talking about and you think, huh, this little thing I've never heard of sounds interesting and my work might fit here, but I don't know if they are reputable or not, Google them. Because if somebody's had a bad experience, I mean, what is the internet if not a big, you know, bitch fest? Everybody's just complaining about everything all the time. You know, but also, I can remember working, I worked with an artist because her work was reproduced in the alumni mag magazine for the high school, the pri for, my kids went to Latin, my older kids. Mm -hmm. And at Latin school, her work was reproduced in there, and I called her up because I saw it reproduced. I don't think it was illustrating anything. It was just that she happened, you know, they, they, need, they had space that needed to be filled. You know, so that sometimes, Sarah, you don't know where the good news is coming from, you know. Mm -hmm. And by putting it out there, maybe something good happens. And, you know, and, but I think also, Lauren's point, you've got to do some research to make sure that it doesn't do any harm. Yeah. Right, and and to talk about the the Tony and the swag and Nick Cave, um, and again I'll I'll provide these links. Um, and if I forget to send you guys links, that I've promised a lot here, and I'll I'll do it. I've noticed that there, there's something happening. Um, lots of artists are having shops on their sites now, and many of them come from illustration schools. 
Um, one of one of them I can think of is James Jean. Uh, he's one of my favorite artists personally. He did all the Fables covers, um, and you would recognize his work. It's been everywhere. But he, you know, he's created his own um, mint tins and sells them for six dollars each, and they're in comic stores across the country. So artists are <coughs> able to control more of their own images and also creating shops on their own site to, to sell their own swag. So, you know, is it good, bad? I don't know. Is it any different than having an Etsy shop and, and selling, uh, you know, drawings? I, everybody has to determine their own course, so. How do you, how do you spell G? It's James Jean, like, uh, like the women's, woman's first name. J E A N James Jean. Oh yeah. Martin Whitfoot is another one I can think of. He's uh, a lot of the artists on the website artistsaday.com. Um, I've noticed have some of their own shops on their website. I've never even looked at that site. All right, I'm going to unmute everybody and see if we have another question. Hold on. Um, all right, you're all unmuted. Okay, um, what was the those two URLs, Jane Jean and the other one, sorry? James Jean. So the, um, I, I, I think his website's probably just jamesjean.com, J-E-A-N. Oh, I see. So it's James, like James Taylor Jean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then Martin something. Oh, Martin Whitfoot. W I T T F O O T H. W I T T S O H. F like Frank. O O T like Tom H. And there was a third one, an artist something dot org. You said. Artist a day, I think it's dot com. Artist a day? Yeah. Okay. D does that stuff fall into the because they come from an illustrator background and now lowbrow art, as they call it, is making like a comeback and there's a big market for it? Does that stuff fall into that category and is that why it's more permissible for them to sell their work in that kind of a market? Um, I, what do you mean by permissible? Do you mean like? Well, I um, guess because there's that that idea that if it was in a magazine and it wasn't used the way you wanted, it could like damage you. Um, what Sarah mentioned. Sarah mentioned. But then if you're. Hold on, I'm gonna move it. Actually, it doesn't matter as long as you're getting your your work out there, and then you build a following that way. So it doesn't it doesn't fall into that category of damaging you, right. I guess. Well, I think, I think you just have to, I can speak now as an artist, as an artist too. There are certainly some publications I would never want my work to appear in. <clears throat> and there are many publications because of the specific type of artwork that I do that I would never even send to. Um, I will never get into the more conceptual um, uh, magazines because that's not the kind of work I do. Uh, I don't use two by fours. I don't use a screw gun um, or anything like that, you know. And I don't make uh, huge public sculptures, so I won't be in sculpture magazine. And then, um, if I, you know, I would, but there are magazines that I would love my work to appear in because it opens you up to a whole new world of people, um, not uh, viewers of um, potential collectors. Um, never underestimate the, the people who are reading specialty publications. They are obsessed about whatever it is they're reading about. Um, so if they can, you know, if they're reading birding magazines and you're, you're you know, doing paintings of eggs, you very well may find a collector that way. Um, but again, they should, you should be getting paid. Um, and, and if it's, if it's not something that you want to do, then you don't have to do it. Um, and if it's not an art magazine, they're probably not going to review you. Do you know what I mean? So it just, mm -hmm. it just depends on where you're sending it, what you can expect back from it. 
Sounds good. Um, maybe we should start thinking about wrapping up tonight's session. I'm going to unmute everybody again and see if anybody else has a question. Let's take one more question, if there is one. It's Johanna. I just have a quick question. Can you hear me? Who's speaking? Wait. That, um, it's Johanna. It's Johanna, Johanna, please go ahead. Um, I was just curious, like, if you want to have um, a show written about, like, how, how much lead time should the press release be sent to that particular event? Um, if you're sending it to just places like Time Out, um, give them at least three weeks. It's the Thursday, three weeks before the issue. Let's take one more question. I'm going to mute everybody again. I don't know how we got such a huge delay there. That's really weird. And then I'm going to unmute Lauren. Go ahead. Okay. So um, if you're just dealing with here in Chicago, uh, most of our local publications have a pretty quick turnaround. Um, so if you're dealing with Time Out, they've got a three-week um, deadline ahead of the issue. So um, I have a client who's doing something the 1st of November. I need to get it in by Thursday. Uh, New City, it, generally the rest of the, the newspapers are two weeks. Um, mm -hmm. If you want radio coverage, again, it depends on the show. But radio and television, they operate on a different time structure. They operate down into the seconds. <laughs> So you can get them information a few days ahead of time. But again, mm -hmm. the glossy magazines, you are working months and months out ahead of time. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, even like Chicago Gallery News, uh, I think they're three months out. So, it, 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 again, it depends on, you know, who you're looking at. Um, they should have their editorial schedule online. And uh, places like Time Out, when they do specialty issues, they have those editorial schedules online usually in their advertising section. Um, <coughs> you know, if you go to any of these uh, publications' websites and just start poking around <coughs> in the department that you're not interested in, you'll learn a lot about them. Good points. All right. Last question. Anybody have a last question? I do. I do. <laughs> go for it. Who's that? Vicki? It's Vicki, yeah. Um, as far as press goes, I've, I've done a few shows at our new place, and I've sent out press releases in a timely fashion, but I guess because we're new um, and I, 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 we're just starting, we didn't get reviewed at all, which was good because we're just starting. But is there a way to um, send out a press release that invites a review in the future as, as opposed to just your general press release? Like, the this two come review our show? Yeah. No, no, wait a second before you answer, Lauren. I got to do the muting thing again. And then, Lauren, you are now unmuted. My biggest tip that I can give you for this is one that nobody thinks of anymore: call them. <laughs> um, and never, well, not never, but just generally call uh, any reporter between a Tuesday and Thursday. Mondays, like everybody is crazy mm -hmm. busy, things will get lost. Friday, things are falling off. Um, you know, they're planning their entire weekend on Friday. I mean, the weekend, like a newspaper or something. So, um, you know, give it, give, just give them a call on a Tuesday morning. Give them a call on a Thursday. Nobody expects a phone call anymore. It, it, it's surprising. Um, this goes back to the elevator speech, too. You make a call, you're probably not going to get an answer. But expect to get their voicemail. Just practice. I, you're going to feel crazy, but just practice in the shower. Hi, this is so-and-so. I wanted to make sure that you received our press release on this day and that you received our images. I would love to see you, you know, and then and then tell them about related events. I'd love to see you on this day or if you can't make it there, on, you know, blah, blah. So reach out and be personal, especially in Chicago. Especially in Chicago, uh, editors love to see communications directly from artists. Um, so for my clients, usually I'm, I'm the first contact the artist will follow up on my advice, and then I will follow up to schedule interviews and uh, okay. get more pictures out to them, stuff like that. Let me say something, because I sit on several sides of this equation, you know, having had a gallery and solicited art critics and now, you know, writing this art letter thing and having people hustle me. Um, it, it goes back again to the same thing about relationships and being friendly, but even more than that, being professional. You know, if somebody does you a good turn, go out of your way to say thank you. Make sure, you know, that doesn't mean you send them a $1,000, you know, gift in exchange for a three-paragraph review. You send them, ideally, a nice, 
handwritten note in an envelope with a handwritten address and a postage stamp. It gets attention. Imagine how you would feel if you got one. You know, it makes a difference. It's all about these personal things and being professional. So you're saying now, if we get a good review to just send them a little thank you note back, a personal thank you note. Yeah, thank you, Joe. It was so great to have you. I'm so happy you love the show. We've got good stuff on the horizon. I hope to see you again someday. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Okay. And, if, and if you know the person or if you really want to thank them or want them to come back again, um, you know, have the artist or you yourself do a little drawing on the inside. Um, there's yeah, that's fabulous. Artist. Wait a minute. I got one here. Wait a minute. I, I'm waiting to get this to the framers. Here we go. Can you see my nice little handwritten note there? See? It came the work of art. Oh, wow. I've been, I've been saving this for like a month because i got to get it framed. This is from Jackie Kazarian, and I wrote one nice sentence about her show at the Cultural Center. Um, you know, it makes a difference. And then there's some people I've written, re I've gone out of my way to write really nice things in the art letter. And pardon my French, but fuck those schmucks for not saying thank you. You know, I mean, I probably won't remember who the hell they are, but I don't need to do something nice to them again. Um, exactly. yeah. You know, yeah. it's about having some kind of manners, and it's about being better than the person, the next person, and, you know, ingratiating yourself a little bit. I think we should wrap this up. I think we've had fabulous information from Bob and Carol, and I think we've had fabulous information mm -hmm. from Lauren. And, uh, Lauren, I want you to send me an email with some of the links you had and contact information. I mean, Lauren is giving of herself generously, and I think it's pretty clear that this is something she does for a living, and she's fully capable of helping you in ways that I'm not helping you and in ways that you should maybe be helping yourself, but you're going to rationalize that she should do it for you or that you really don't want to deal with that. I mean, you know, like we can talk about art dealers for a moment. I'm not convinced that everybody needs an art dealer, but there's a lot of good things an art dealer does. If you don't want to do them, maybe it's wise for you to have an art dealer do that. In that situation, I think you need to be more demanding, more responsible, and ask for the things that you want to get. I think you can have a, a saner conversation with Lauren about what she's capable of doing for you, and you can make a decision about whether you're better off trying to do it yourself, whether you're better off hire, you know, having her do it with you. And maybe, I don't know if, Lauren, this is true or not. I remember when I created my first website, oh, my God, over 20 years ago, I hired somebody to do it, and he wanted to charge me $25 every time I corrected my misspellings or punctuation. So I finally said to him, dude, why don't I just, you know, you're on retainer. I prepaid you for six months. Why don't you teach me how to do what you do? And he said, okay, I'll do that. So he did that. Now, I'm not putting words in Lauren's mouth. But, you know, maybe she can help you help yourself while she's helping you. Exactly. And not, Lauren? The bar for everybody, so. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that's what we're all trying to do is make this better for all of us so that we all get more results and we're all happier with what and how we're doing. Um, Lauren, thank you very much. I, I, I've enjoyed this, awesome. and I think we're due for lunch again. Um, yeah, thank you. And all of you guys, we have next Monday – I think we're going back to Tony Fitzpatrick's studio, and Tuesday we're going to Kurt and Jennifer Conklin's house and talk to them about what and why they collect and their attitudes and like that. Um, I think this has been a good evening. Does anybody want to say anything before I wrap this up? I'm going to unmute everybody so it sounds really bad. Hold on. You're all thought, unmuted. I thought Tony Fitzpatrick was Friday, the 22nd. <clears throat> I'm going to have to double check. I know that it's Monday, but I'm going to double check and make sure because I know he's going to Istanbul and I feel like we're getting him when he's gone. So, I mean, we changed it, so I'll double check and let you know. Yeah. What time is it? Is it a Tuesday trip? I think. I think it's supposed to be mid afternoon, maybe 4 o'clock. I don't remember. And I think Tony's supposed to be 3 o'clock on Monday. Can you confirm that, Paul? The Tuesday? I'm sorry, say that again? Will you confirm the time for the Tuesday trip? Yes, I'll confirm them. I, I'll do both those tomorrow. I'll do that and let you all know. Damn, I got Friday off to go. <laughs> I thought it was still Friday. It, yeah, then I changed. Yeah, I got to double check. Great talking to you. Lauren, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Okay. Thank Bye. You. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you so Thanks. much. Welcome. Bye-bye. See you. See if she can leave. Um, anybody else? <laughs>
I actually had a um, hey Paul. Yes. This is Johanna. Sorry, I, I actually wanted to ask Lauren really quickly that um, maybe you know the answer to this, but if, if you're sending a press release like it's a little bit late for the opening reception, would you advise that one sends it anyway so that they can make they can still get it during the run of the show? I think so, but I think you look a little bit amateur doing that, and you, maybe you can say somebody else is supposed to do it, and they didn't do it, so I want to make sure you know about it. Um, and or I'm seeing more and more closings happening. If you have a closing, you could send that out as a reminder. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not going to sort of backfire or look bad, but it's, it's not. Oh, this is your show? Yeah. I think you can definitely do that. I think it's got a nice synergy between the, because of all the artists in it and everything, and I think you could play that up and talk about how if you get a chance to see a show, you're, 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 you're doing a nice thing for a lot of Chicago artists. Mm -hmm. It's okay. okay. That's it, guys. We're done until next week. Well, you'll let All us right. know, though, when we're... What, oh, Vicky? You'll let us know when we're meeting, right? The, if it's Friday or Monday. I know it's Monday, but I'm going to confirm it anyway. I just okay. checked your, your email, and you have Friday the 22nd on an email you gave to me for Tony Fitzpatrick. I know, but if you have to look at the website to see what's most accurate. Ah. Because the 22nd, Tony is in Istanbul, and we weren't going to go with him. <laughs> and Tony, at one point, had scheduled that, and then Tony's assistant, Stan, had changed it. So, Jess, I'll, let you, I'll, I'll get this out in the morning. I'll find out. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right, everybody. Good night. Good night. Right, and I'll also send out a link to all the recordings to everybody, too. So, okay. thank you all very much. Good night. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.